Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good, good. Who's ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. Who's got the lights up? Who's burning candles? This is the time when we do start seeing lights all around us. And um, I know just sitting in a room that's not lit by the lights on the, on the ceiling around us, but the lights we put up and the low glow is very peaceful. As we get ready for Christmas, let us also prepare ourselves for Jesus, who has come to us as the light of the world, a light that penetrates the dark world and offers peace. Let us pray. Father God, let the light of Christ shine in our lives so that we may glorify you. Help us to walk in the light to the Lord. And Lord, please teach us the truth in your word. In your pray. Amen. Today's psalm is Psalm 72. We're going to read verses 1 through 7. You're welcome to join. This is by Solomon, King Solomon, and he's um, writing about his, um, his son becoming the new ruler. Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son of your righteousness. May, the, may he judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones with justice. May the mountains bring prosperity to the people, the hills the fruit of righteousness. May he defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. May he crush the oppressor. May he endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon through all generations. May he be like rain falling on a moon field, like showers watering the earth. In his days, may the righteous flourish and prosperity abound till the moon is no more. Thank you, Lord. Please join us for a hymn of praise. O come, O come, Emmanuel, page 211. One of my favorites, so sing loud.
for a flush of song found in your bulletin. Emmanuel, Emmanuel.
video with fossil fuel. Okay. Y'all stay saying it. <laughs> <laughs> We're not done yet. We're not done yet. Page 881, please join us. The Apostles' Creed, I faith. I believe in God, Advent count. Good morning. Um, now we are going to light the candle for the second Sunday of Advent. This is the candle of peace. As we prepare for the coming of Jesus, we remember that Jesus is our hope and our peace. From the prophet Isaiah, For a child is, has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And from the Gospel of John, Peace I leave, you, I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. I do not let your hands be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. Thank you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in this season of preparation, Lord, help us to walk in your light, in the light of the Lord, the light that offers everyone peace who sees it. Lord, help our community to see and to feel this light of peace in this church, Lord. And bless our givings through our prayers and our presence and our service and our, our witness in it as well. In your prayer. Amen. Amen.
Betty Seated. So for those of you who've been around all this week, it has been pretty much a non-stop barrage of events. Probably not going to slow down until uh, after Christmas. We do want to welcome Dr. Reverend Doug Parash, who's here to be with us to worship and also uh, to preside over our church conference, which is going to take place immediately after this service. Or, or almost immediately after. We've got a couple more printouts to make. But uh, we invite everybody to be a part of that. So we talk about the business of the church for the next year. We're going to uh, vote on our leadership team. And I'll say as a pastor, one of the great blessings for church of the size is we have more able, willing volunteers than we have slots. And so we're kind of going back and forth. And uh, Now that being said, we also have a wonderful little tradition in Ebenezer is that it seems like before people even join, we get them doing stuff. And I think maybe as a defensive measure, the Jernigans, Melinda and Jean, joined this morning at 8.30. And, and I think they're hoping maybe we'll back off a little bit. Now. <laughs> so we're very blessed to have them part of this service. And so you'll see the announcements in your uh, in your bulletin things coming up this week. And the continuing with joy, so our widows group will be meeting Tuesday. And we'll go back to full uh, regular Wednesday night services. We had our hanging of the greens Wednesday, and there must have been, must have had 50, 60 people here doing that. You can see the effort that went in. Still probably have a little more to do, but uh, we're getting close to being prepared for Christmas. So grateful for your presence. Uh, there's, there's just always something going on. There's so many reasons to be in prayer. We just ask that, that uh, what's the first vow we take when we join the church? Then we're going to support the church in prayer. So every Monday we begin in here at 9 a.m. Well, perfect. You're invited to attend if you can't make it and have a specific prayer concern. Uh, please write it on a piece of paper and give it to me later. Just make sure that we're aware of that so we can be faithful. I would ask you to keep all the names and your bold in there in prayer. Uh, particularly, uh, uh, Gary Williams will be having surgery in a couple weeks. I pray for Gary and for Diane. Uh, Norman Quinn, you know, Norman and Eugene have been so faithful for years supporting this church every, every week early at the 830 service. Norman is very sick, and his uh, hospice has been called in, and he's at Roswell Nursing Home. I'll encourage you, if you can't drop by, say hello, maybe to write a note to Eugene and let her know she's not here, she's not forgotten, and neither one of them will be, so I encourage you to uh, just remember them. And what are the prayer concerns or thanksgiving you want to raise up this morning? Yes, sir. The uh, gentleman, David Oliver, that we've been praying for for probably over a year, he, his wife almost lost him again about two weeks prior to Thanksgiving, but he's back home again. This has been going on for several years, and she told me to please tell everybody thank you so much for the prayers. Thank you. Yes, Ruby. Um, Brian's twin sister also fractured her tail with a vertebrae, so she's in the rehab. Mm -hmm. um, and also his sister Pam had too many strokes, so it's been a little strange mm -hmm. this fall. Okay, thank you. Can you say it first thing again? Uh, his, his twin sister Barbara, um, yeah. and then his sister Pamela. Yes, sir. I like prayers for the Smith family um, who lost the dad and his daughter in purple automobile accident. It was in our group on our street, so we're sort of. Right. It's, it's hard. Okay. Um, I know it's happy out. I want to say thanks for the rain. Well, thanks for the rain. Yeah. It's nice to say that. It's all the bad. It's a good thing. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Grateful for the rain. Sure, is that you? Yeah. You get somebody else to point us on. Straight up. Straight up. Okay, that's Terry. Um, my aunt, uh, Margaret Yanovich, who lives in St. Louis, Missouri, had, was in severe back pain earlier this week. And I guess um, over the phone, the doctor prescribed some prednisone and everything. And, and then um, I guess when she woke up, I think it was yesterday morning, she was not able to walk. So they took her to the hospital. She's going to be in the hospital in St. Louis, Missouri for uh, a couple of days, I guess. And then um, they think it's like, there's nothing fractured. They think, at this point, they think it's just really bad arthritis, I guess. I'm just a pinched nerve. Uh, but she's going to be transported uh, uh, to um, get some rehab, like a nursing facility, uh, within a couple of days. So prayers for her healing. Who was that? 
And, and please continue to uh, and keep Reverend Claude Smithmeyer. He's been in our opponent for a long time. He's a very dear friend in this church, and, and he's just not been well at all. And, uh, and Claude and his wife are wonderful folks. We just want to keep. Yes, Ed? Well, I got to give thanks for uh, seeing back at Joe's head. I usually sit on the other side and didn't recognize until he just turned. wonderful <laughs> 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 Amen. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, Daddy? Yeah, we need to find exactly where Claudia is. And, and, and that's like good help. Yeah, you got to Scotty got a good report. I did. All right. Yes, Gigi. Um, I just like to say that I'm thankful that um, there are members from four generations of our family here at church today. Well, wow. yeah. yeah. That means there's young people here. <laughs> I love young people. <laughs> okay. Let us uh, just now be in. Oh, one more. Yes, David. Uh, uh, I just wanted to uh, welcome Susan. She is in our Bible study on Fridays. So uh, we uh, invited her to come today. All right, let us not give Susan anything to do yet, though. <laughs> 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 All right, let's, uh, let's, yes, David. Yeah, i just like to ask for prayers uh, for safe travel. We're going on a 500-mile bike ride starting next Sunday uh, from, Natchez, from Nashville to Natchez. And uh, prayers for safe travel and good weather. Yeah, David is riding 500 miles, which at his age is astonishing. <laughs> <laughs> it's astonishing. But he, he's, he's raising money for Beaches Run Village, the orphanage that we support in Kenya. So it's a very good cause. And uh, so I'm sure we appreciate any other contributions. He's already reached his goal. Now he just has to ride the 500 miles. <laughs> just. Just, yeah. yeah. All right, let us, uh, let's be in an attitude of prayer. Mm -hmm. Lord, it is so good to hear, to be here in the presence of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask that you would uh, just continue to pour out your Spirit on us, that this would be consecrated ground. Lord, we give you thanks for hearing cars driving through the rain outside that we so desperately need. Lord, we just, we're just so thankful for all that you have done and for the faithful service of the volunteers and for that great cloud of witnesses that has come before us. We thank you for them. We thank you for the answered prayers that we've experienced here, for the miracles that continue to happen. And Lord, you've heard our concerns. We pray for more. Lord, where there's physical healing, we ask for that. And even more importantly, for a spiritual awakening and transformation for those who need that. For relationships and families that have been under stress, Lord, we just pray <coughs> that you can reconcile and bring peace to those families at this season of peace. Lord, for every name listed in our bulletin, for every spoken concern as well as unspoken concern, it is our desire to lay it at the foot of your throne. And Lord, just that you would uh, you would heal your people. Lord, we just uh, we desire that you would bring revival to this land, that there would be that there would be a great awakening, that we would humble ourselves and turn our face toward you, and in all things, Lord, that you would order our steps, uh, that we may take advantage of every opportunity that we've been given to just, just share this message, this love that you have given us. Especially, Lord, that we could uh, remain focused and like-minded of one accord, working together as a body of believers and 
celebrating that we can gather here with the laughter and the joy and, and also the support. Lord, that we can be here praying together as a group of your children and praying in the words you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please rise and join us for our hymn of preparation. In the bleak the glare, page 221. The idea is that we want to make everything presentable because we know that presentation and staging go a long way, don't they? You can cover up a lot of things with presentation and staging. Matter of fact, it's kind of amazing to me that, you know, I kind of like, I kind of like, you know, Golden Corral. Where I, I, I prefer you measure food not, more by quantity, by the pound, rather than, you know. But then again, you, know, if, you get that little plate, you know, you get the little plate, you put the little bit of food in there and... And uh, they put the, uh, you know, they, they put some sprinkles on it and, and kind of, you know, run a little fancy little stuff over the top of it. And a little thing, it's like, well, that's $50. See, it's all presentation, right? As a matter of fact, I think I, I remember reading about, you know, Master Chef using Spam, you know, putting a little crackers and presentation. It's like, mmm, great pate. Spam. Staging and presentation, you know, that presence. Like, if you've ever been involved in, like, looking to buy a house and you go to the model, right? Go look around the model home. And it's like you walk around the model and it's like, wow, this is awesome, isn't it? We've got to buy this place. Look, look, look at, and, and then you do. You put the money on, you buy, you walk in, and then you move your stuff in. It happened. <laughs> See, it was cleaned up, it was presented, it was staged. And, of course, we want to be beautiful and present ourselves well, but the Lord doesn't worry not much about presentation or staging. What he matters is about hearts and minds. 
That's what our scripture is about today. If you turn to Gospel of Matthew, if you have your Bible, it's time to get it out. If you don't, there may be a pew Bible ahead of you. I'd invite you to read along Matthew chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 1 through 12. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling out in the desert, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea, and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear the threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This is the good news of the gospel. This is the word of God for the people of God. <clears throat> okay, we talk about presentation and staging because we, we, we know it really does make a difference, you know, whether it's a job interview or whether you're going on the first date. or whatever. And what the Lord does here, not just the presentation, but it's the other thing that you hear real estate, the, the number one rule of real estate, location, 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 right? And when you talk to people about the retail and sales, they would tell you is, you know, convenience, right? It's all about, and even churches, convenience and location makes all the difference in the world. So what is God doing? His chosen messenger, let's stick him out in the desert. Now, by the way, anybody want to go out in the desert other than like scorpions and snakes and stuff you don't want to be around? So the Lord chooses this wild man after 400 years of quiet from prophet Malachi until we see in the Gospels silence, no prophets and, and here comes a forerunner of Christ and he's sent out to a desert and, and what's he wearing? Camel hair and he's got, he's got a leather belt, that's not bad, but he's eating locusts and wild honey and people are drawn out. He's preaching a message of baptism for repentance. People are flooding out and all of a sudden then he sees the Pharisees and the Sadducees these are the most honored among the Jews. They look good. They're educated. You know they're going to stand tall. And rather than just having coats of camel hair, they might have 18 layers, which was not unusual, their clothing. They would have like silk and undergarments, and they would have special tassels, embroidery, and the best of all linen, educated. Right? These are, these are the people that you want to be your leaders and highly moral. The folks who didn't smoke, cuss, drink, or hang out with women that do. They prayed all the time. They were faithful. People turned to them. And yet when this wild man in the desert sees them, he says, you brood of vipers. Now, we talk about not being judgmental and loving. We want to be, you know, sort of huggy and touchy. And it's like, that makes us a little uncomfortable. You brood of vipers. Who warned you? for the coming wrath. And so how is it that the Lord would take one man to stand up against this assembly, this group? Because a lot of times we think, we think there's comfort in a crowd, right? We think as long as we're going along with the group that there's got to be some safety there. It's like that bandwagon effect. And not really true, is it? Y- y'all ever followed the crowd thinking you weren't exactly sure where to go? And, and instead, you know, you just, well, well they've got to be going the right way. you ever done that? How's that worked out for you? Sometime it works out. Remember when the first games at the Georgia Dome, and I'd worked on the special section. I knew all about the Georgia Dome. top level. So we're, we're coming out with these big games, a big crowd, and, and we're trying to figure out how to get out of here. And on the bottom level, it was like, well, here goes all the folks. So I'm following this big mob, and all of a sudden we go on these stairs. We've got to go up because we're in the lower level. We're going up the stairs, another set of stairs. 
and all of a sudden then we stop because of this deck and the top door is locked. There's a few hundred of us stuck in there like, well, I guess we need to turn around. Following the crowd is not always the best indication that we're going the right way. And so what the Lord does over and over again, He chooses one that stands out, that stands for truth. You look at Noah, you know, facing ridicule. And Noah, through which the world is going to be saved. One man spent all that time in faithfulness, despite what others may have been thinking. And then when the Lord called upon Moses, said, Moses, you're going to free the people. I've heard the cries of my people. After 400 years of captivity, what does Moses say? Uh, I, I really don't speak very well. I'm slow of speech. I, and then the Lord explains to him, you know, I'm the one who created, I'm the one who makes all the mouths for men, and I understand how well you speak and hear. And Moses says, can you pick somebody else? The Lord selects his chosen instruments because they're chosen instruments. And to him it does not matter what you profess to have as your strengths. It doesn't matter who else goes along. Is that our call from Christ, it's individual. We gather as a group and we worship as a group, but ultimately the call on our lives is personal and intimate and individual. And the Lord has used people throughout the years to speak, to speak to assemblies and gatherings and groups that get sobered. Because it's easy when we encourage each other. It's easy when we sort of enable each other to fail the greater purpose and what God calls us to do, which is often counterintuitive. You know, it's not, it's not right for you. It, it's, I want to be loving and forgiving naturally. But what we can't do is say, well, you know, we're not perfect, so Glenn, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ignore your, you know, the, your shortcomings, your sin, that's okay. And I say, well, I'll ignore yours too. We can't, it, we've got to hold each other to accountability, especially those in leadership, especially. Because it's too easy when we're within that, that group to kind of enable one another and the Pharisees. I'm sure they started out with good intent. I'm sure they meant well. I'm sure they, 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 the desire to seek God, somehow they missed the mark, and then it took this wild man in the desert, make straight your paths to the Lord. Prepare, because I baptize with water, but the one coming after me is greater than me. He will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, if you all know the symbol in United Methodist Church is a cross and a flame, and that flame represents the Holy Spirit is God is a consuming fire that burns away the chaff and the garbage and leaves. Well, leaves what's good. And so we have to be willing to listen to that still voice in the desert that calls us, not the repentance, but the holiness. So we be used. Others. Now, now, fortunately, I guess we're not really, you know, maybe called to eat locusts and wild honey. Thank the Lord. But whatever He does call us to do individually is to be to serve Him in His kingdom. I think a lot of times we, we, we get into trouble because we see what's working for somebody else. Right? We see what's working. And this happens with a lot of churches, which is they'll look at other churches as being successful, and then they'll, you know, the pastors will write books and they'll do videos, and here's the new model, here's how you reach. And they're, and they're working but they're working for them. Because God doesn't do anything the same. If there's no two snowflakes or no two grains of sand or no two stars that are the same, we know there's no two people at the same. Because it's the glory of God. He's a God of abundance. And so He has an individual call in our lives and then for us, and and the goal for us is to listen to that still small voice, to have ears to hear and be sensitive all through Scripture. See the Lord using one person to stand up. In the 22nd chapter of 1 Kings, <clears throat> King Ahab of Israel and Jehoshaphat of Judah, looking at it, he realized that for years now, the king of Abraham has held the property of Ramoth Gilead. And, and they said, you know, isn't it time we went to, this is our property. You know, let's go down there and take this Ramoth Gilead that belongs to us from King Aram. And, and so uh, King Jehoshaphat says to King Ahab, he says, well, do we have some prophets we can ask? That's some prophets whether it's a good idea or not. So, so the, the king of Israel calls in 400 prophets. They say, this is our plan. We want to go in and take this land that belongs to us from King Aram. It's okay. And they all say the same thing. Oh, yeah, the Lord will let that happen. 
He wants to say, if you do that, you're going to be victorious. And so it seemed like a consensus, and then uh, King Jehoshaphat said the king, Ahab, he said, was well, there a- any of the prophets of God? He goes, well, there's one, but I don't like him. I hate him. Micaiah. He says, why do you like Micaiah? He says, because he never gives me good news. And, and, and so King Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat says, don't hate him because of that. So let's bring him in and talk to him. So, so they, they bring in Micaiah, and uh, Ahab says, you know, we've got this plan to, to, to take this land that belongs to us. I know you'll tell me the truth. He says, I will. I can only tell you what I, I see that, that God has shown me. And he said that uh, I see the Israelites scattered because they have no leader. And, of course, that meant that the king was going to end up being killed, and the king is upset, and so he has Micaiah thrown in the prison, and Micaiah says, well, that's okay. If the king returns and I'm here, then I didn't hear from God, uh, but pay attention because he's not coming back. And he didn't. It was one man anointed by God who spoke something that people didn't want to hear for a purpose. And so John the Baptist out in the wilderness is, is another form of Elijah, and we know from 1 Kings 18 chapters that, is that they'd gone through, they got through a drought for years. And so King Ahab says, Elijah, this is your fault. We're in a drought. And Elijah says, it's not my fault. He says, you've gone off and worshiped foreign gods. He said, it's time that we had a showdown here. And so Elijah said, I'll tell you what, let's get the prophets of Baal. They bring 450 prophets of Baal. They said, let's find out whether Jehovah is God or let's find out whether Baal is God. We're going to build two altars. We put a sacrifice on there. And what other God consumes sacrifice? That's God. Everybody likes that plan. Prophets of Baal, it's a good plan. And so prophets of Baal set up their, their altar and they, they, they kill a bull. They put it on there and they're going to go first. And, and so all through the day, prophets of Baal are like calling upon Baal to come and consume the sacrifice. And nothing's happening, nothing's happening. Times go out. And, and Elijah starts goading them, starts mocking them. He says, well, well per, perhaps your God's gone on vacation. Talk louder. The prophets are called all louder. And, and actually the translation is some said, you know, maybe he's, maybe he's gone to the bathroom. Call louder. And, and so they're, they're calling out to, to Baal, nothing's happening. And they show how sincere they are. They're like beating themselves and whipping themselves. They're, and they're getting bloody. Now, that's sincerity, isn't it? That's really belief. But we can be sincerely wrong. Right? The people that bled George Washington when he was sick, they were sincere. They killed him, but they meant well. And so the prophets of Baal are 450 or whipping themselves, beating themselves, and nothing happens. And then Elijah says, okay, well, I'm going to build my altar. And on top of that, he put... 12 stones around and he put wood on top of that and, and they dug a trench around it and on the altar he put that uh, the pieces of the bowl and he calls on Jehovah he's got four large buckets of water four large large urns of water as a poured over top of that sacrifice and so the, the, the four, four big urns of water flow down he says fill them again and the four big buckets of water again and, and, and poured over and water Flows down again. He says, fill them again. So a third time, fill those four large containers and pour them the sacrifice. And then he calls on the Lord God of Israel, Jehovah. And that meat is burned up, soaked as it is, as well as the 12 stones, as well as the altar, as well as the water in the trench around it and the sand consumed. One man standing against 450 must have been a lonely place. Uh, the thing sometimes we, we, we you know, might feel like we're isolated on the limb, but the most important thing is consensus is okay as long as God is part of that consensus. But I always need to realize is that, is that you know, for peace, in this time of peace, is, is that me and God are a majority. And no matter how difficult or, or things may seem, that if, if we don't get distracted by others and we don't get distracted by others who, who are sort of enabling each other and we really have our eyes open, our ears open, and allow the Lord to speak to us so that sincerity, not matter, just so that 
we hear from Him and are willing to stand our ground because He's always using one person who may not be the best dressed, may not be the best spokesman, may not be the most educated, but God uses the weak to shame the strong. And so He uses John the Baptist as another form of Elijah, and He hasn't stopped doing that. You, you look at the people, you know, and individuals in our lives who, who thought enough and were concerned about ridicule to share their faith with you. Once they're willing to give you a ride or, or whatever, whatever it took to encourage you in the faith and willing to walk along with you when others didn't. A little support, because even though the call of God is individual on each one of us, He does use us to serve and reach out to others. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen that movie, Hacksaw Ridge, it just came out. I'll tell you a little about it. It won't ruin it because you can't ruin it. Doesn't matter if you know the whole story. It's worth seeing. A little violence. That'd be a little... Yeah, yeah. I was ducking a little bit. <clears throat> it, it, it's a true story of uh, Desmond Doss who uh, was born in Virginia and when he signed up to go to World War II and he was... Uh, even though he signed up, he was sort of a conscientious objector that he refused to carry a weapon because he didn't want to kill anybody because as a committed believer, as a Christian, he said... I want to go help people. I want to save life, not take life. So he started to become a medic. So he was an outlier. So he, he tells the army he signs up for, says, I want to be a medic. Of course, the army being the army says, Good. they assign him to a rifle company. Now, of course, he goes to the rifle company. It's all true. And he goes and he refuses to pick up a rifle. And they didn't applaud him. They didn't salute him. Matter of fact, they did everything they could to make him miserable so that he would leave. He refused to. And so finally, through all these battles from other soldiers and then even from officers, they couldn't drive him out despite the abuse. And so he stayed. A lot of them thought he was a coward or, or didn't really believe his convictions. And so he ended up in going into the Pacific. And in May 1945 in Okinawa, Japanese had been dug in there for a long, long time. They had tunnels and they had all sorts of supports, and a uh, 350-foot enclave here that could only be climbed with ropes and ladders. And, and time after time, when the United States forces tried to go up there and take this property, they were, they were forced back with great, great numbers of casualties. Devastating. If you remember the Battle of the Pacific, it was, nothing about it was pretty. It's horrible. And so the 77th infantry that he was a part of takes its turn and of the rope, and they are uh, face withering fire, and are chopped up, and, and the men start hustling back down, wounded, bleeding, dead. And uh, Desmond didn't leave with them. Without a rifle or gun, he stayed up there. Matter of fact, he stayed alone for 12 hours that time, exposing himself to gunfire the whole time. A little skinny guy. Car carrying the wounded soldiers and then lowering down one after the other. Man, unarmed, up there surrounded by Japanese, praying to the Lord the whole time. You know what he kept praying? One more. Lord, let me get one more. And, he, and he's physically worn out. And as a matter of fact, later on, see, he, he was exposed to fire and, and he was wounded. His arms going off around him. And later on, one of the Japanese soldiers said, he, was, he said, I had him dead to rights. I had him my sights. But every time I pulled the trigger, it misfired. How do you think that happened? And so he stayed up there hour after hour alone, unarmed, lowering men down. He was the only conscientious objector in World War II won a Medal of Honor. The people that had been mocking him, people who had been trying to drive him out, said it's the bravest man I ever saw. He would not stop. He would not. At one point, he got, he got severely injured, and they, and they put him on a truck, and they were, this one in the movie, actually part of the real story, and they're hauling him out of there, and he saw another man who was injured, and he rolled off the truck and went over to rescue him and had to wait many more hours for him to be rescued himself. Lord, just one more. One more. You know how many men he saved? I said 75. 75. One man unarmed. There was actually one point when he was in a foxhole, his company, and he heard the Japanese around him. He said, this was the time I was really tempted to pick up arms because he thought, you know, not only was he going to die, but he was worried about his comrade was going to die. And so it was one time he said, we had grenades here. If I just picked up a couple of grenades and threw them, I, I know I could, you know, 
take out some Japanese and maybe protect us. He said, but I didn't. I didn't do it. And here's why. I knew if I allowed myself to compromise once, I'd compromise again. That's the message of John the Baptist. Which is we repent, we turn, and we don't allow, we're not going to allow compromise. We're not going to enable. One, do we have a God of mercy? We have a God who's a consuming fire, who burns away all the chaff and purifies us, not just for us, so that we can serve others. We have a God who says, I know, I know numbers are important. Numbers are a big deal. We got one of many who can't, we're a Lord who says, just one more. Just one more. That's what our heart needs to be for the lost, for just one more. Let me tell you, you, you can ask Dr. Thrasher how this works. We talked about this, but I'll tell you, he'll tell you the same thing I'm going to tell you because I've, I've seen enough of the churches that are inward focused, the churches that look this way, die. Might be slow, they die. Churches that are outward focused, those are when the Lord blesses. So we can, we can debate about what that means when it's, but that's a, that's a simple rule of thumb, which is inward. And you know why? Because God is outward focused. Because when one sinner repents, one, there's dancing in heaven. There's celebration. And so for us, the question is, doesn't need to be a thousand, doesn't need to be five hundred. Our question needs to be one. Just one. Let us pray. Lord, help us to have a heart for the lost. Help us, Lord, not to get distracted by exterior presentation, by how things look. Help us, Lord, to see beyond that, that we might understand the people who you love who are hurting, that we would go after them regardless of what it might cost us, just that it would bring rejoicing in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> There's no better representation of the Lord's love for us and sacrifice for us and the honor we have in the first Sunday of the month of celebrating Holy Communion together. This is a special communion that in the last couple of weeks, David McBride has known that uh, we've, been, we've been trying to find good unleavened bread and we couldn't find it, so David is now making it every, uh, every Saturday, every day before we have communion. James was there helping yesterday. So you got a couple men making communion bread. <clears throat> so that's what we're going to be celebrating today. So on that night that Jesus gave himself up for us, when he was in the upper room with his disciples, he took the bread and he gave thanks. And he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, Jesus took the cup. Again, he gave thanks. Gave the cup to his disciples and he said, This is my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord, we ask that you would bless these elements of blood, of bread and juice, that these elements might become the body and blood of Christ for us, that we may be the body of Christ for the world, cleansed by his blood. Lord, consecrate these elements for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to ask those who are going to assist to come forward at this time. What happens this morning?
I remind you all, in the United Methodist Church, it, this table is open to all, because this table does not belong to the United Methodist Church or to Ebenezer. This table was paid for by Jesus Christ. That means you all are invited. I would ask you to come forward and receive by intention. So if you come forward, your hands made in the cross, and we'll give you a piece of the communion bread. You will dip it in the cup. And uh, if you want to spend a moment at the altar, you can do that. The table has been prepared. Come as you would. If you want to go on the left side. Our hymn of invitation.
start? Yep. Page 234, O-Come, are you paid?